Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me start with thanking for organize, uh, inviting me to this important conference and giving me the opportunity to speak for such a respect audience. Uh, I would like to begin by starting that courts and judges um, uh, have power, uh, power over the meaning of, uh, of the law. It's so uh, because courts uh, represent uh, the last link in the chain of making, interpreting, and applying law. Let's explain why my uh, presentation is one of the last ones. It should be the last one. <laughs> and um, uh, we change a little uh, our program. It's also the reason why it is so important to determine how judges can and should exercise their power. Uh, on the one hand, we believe that um, uh, the law operates by the way uh, the, way the lawmaker has intended, has made it. Uh, on the other, the lawmaker decision is a formalized, conventional text uh, whose real face is revealed once it starts to be applied and interpreted. Um, I was asked to present uh, my arguments in the light of a legal positivism. Um, this is an ambitious, uh, but at the same time, a very topical task. Uh, the question uh, concerns the role played by judges in the process of applying the law, as well as, as, well as the role in the public life, uh, this power which I mentioned before. The courts have always sought, and rightly so, to be freed of political influence. Uh, legal positivism was an expression, actually a guarantee, of the politics, uh, politicism of judges. Today's debate about the admissibility and scope of a judicial activism raises concerns about the broadly understood politic politicization of judges. The question is also about whether formalized law should be the sole basis on which judges make their determinations. Whether, and if so, uh, to what extent can moral issues be the subject of judicial deliberation, uh, and whether such issues shouldn't belong to the exclusive competence of the lawmaker. Uh, the title of my presentation also presumes the existence of a judicial dilemmas. Uh, should judges have dilemmas? Should they be uh, regarded uh, as unthinking mach machines whose task is to apply legislation? Uh, I can answer these questions right away. Uh, judges should be torn by dilemmas. Uh, a judge who has no doubts is a very dangerous judge. The notions of a uh, dilemma that lawyers use to express their moral experience uh, as it relates to exercise of their provision is much broader than the one used in ethics. Uh, it uh, encompasses not too much ethical dilemmas in the stride meaning of the word, but also many other situations that lawyers uh, regard as a morally difficult or questionable. Um, and it is uh, precisely such more difficult uh, or questionable situation that may us uh, ask the following questions. How should judges conduct themselves and how the law should be applied in a specific situation? So with respect to legal positivism, we are dealing with a dispute over whether judicial activism should be admissible and if yes, uh, then uh, with a framework or of this excessive activity of the judges, the dispute concerns the grounds on which judges should take their decisions. Provisions of law are constructed so as to give judges a margin of discretion to allow them to make their own assessments. The application of law is not a zero-sum uh, system. If legal norms were created to make only the interpretation leading to only the one right decision possible, there would be no need for judges. Uh, one could also um, envisage a scenario uh, that which progress uh, in new technologies and big data, some of today's judicial decision, will soon be replaced by algorithms. 
we were talking before about it, especially when it comes to cases involving a simple juxtaposition on facts and the relevant, uh, relevant uh, norm. Uh, answering the questions based on the uh, book Homo Deus, uh, which I read uh, before, um, in my opinion, such situation, situation involving uh, cases uh, um, uh, in which we can use the algorithm would be quite rare. I can imagine, for example, um, uh, registration, uh, registration uh, cases. Uh, uh, cases, not to mention the hardest ones, are usually com complex and the assessment is open to different interpretation, uh, which are uh, deri deri derivative um, um, uh, of both of state of knowledge of judge and his independence and uh, as well as um, conscience of judge. Um, a positivism approach to law works during times of stability, when there are uh, fundamental differences between codified law, uh, there is no uh, fundamental differences between codified law and the values accepted by the society. As the previous speakers have pointedly um, demonstrated, it is not the case of today. This uh, reason alone uh, argues in favor of open governance of the cards as opposed to, uh, opposite to uh, positive uh, isolationism of judges. Even though there are no doubts that the judge should not replace a lawmaker, since his role is not to apply the law, uh, not to make it, to apply, not to make it. Almost always the judge has to adjust the law to the needs of a specific case so that he can deliver, deliver a fair ruling. His judicial conscience can help him to do that. In Poland, every incumbent judge takes an oath from the President of the Republic of Poland. This oath uh, says that the judge will rule consistently with the laws uh, in force and his own conscience. So, conscience is mm, affirmed by legal norm. Uh, we can distinguish a situation uh, when the judge conscience can operate. Uh, the first analogy that comes to mind the uh, f mm, uh, medicine uh, area, I mean uh, phys uh, physician's uh, conscience clause. Yet it's hard to accept the application uh, of this clause directly. If by operation of law judges could invoke the conscience clause, this would practically give them the right to refuse to examine a case uh, on the grounds of their uh, world view. I believe that this, is, uh, this should not be so. The judge task and service is to rule on every case that he or she examines. Attorney at law can refuse to take a case. Uh, or can say that something cannot be done. Judge can do that. Second, judicial resistance of legal change. Uh, it refers to situation in which projected and or enacted uh, legislative changes cause individual judges to resent them out of a critical assessment of the rationality of such proposed legislation or out of habit and skepticism towards anything new. It often takes one of a form of a sort of internal voice of opposition. This voice is not triggered uh, by a system of uh, private religious or ethical beliefs, like in the case of a conscience clause, but rather by uh, broadly understood professionalism, both in the positive sense, I mean knowledge and experience, um, and in the negative sense, conservatism and routine. Third situation, which is the most important for us, situation in which um, axiological conflicts occur can trigger problems with a judge conscience. However, these problems are different than the ones described above that uh, we, are, uh, we were compared to um, a physician's conscience clause. Uh, their source is not, strictly speaking, a religious or uh, ethics um, worldview, not only, but rather that uh, it refers to hard cases. Uh, this involves situation when the application of a specific piece of legislation forces the judge to make a ruling, 
which, uh, with which uh, he doesn't agree on the grounds of his professional standards uh, of um, legitimacy. And this, is, this last dilemma is a subject of particular interest from the point of view of my subject matter for this presentation. It assumes that uh, in situation like this, um, uh, the clash between a judge's conscience and his duty uh, of obedience uh, to the act of law can lead to the one of the following situation. In the first case, we can be dealing with escape into formalism and application of uh, an act uh, of law irrespective of its moral or amoral nature or the effects of its application. This brings us close to the legal positivism, which gives a judge the comfort of solving all his doubts for him. Since the act of law says so, the judge's internal conviction is of no importance. The judge turns his back to the problem and hides behind the authority of the formal letter of the law. In the second case, the judge may reject as uh, an immoral act of law and rule contra legem on the grounds of what his conscience dicta dictated uh, him to do. If it happens, uh, then uh, the judge has to consider the possibility that his judgment will be squashed and uh, the judgment of the last uh, instance has to be ready to accept that the ruling which is contrary to the law will be uh, criticized. The third possibility is to resign from the job. Uh, this is a simple solution, but uh, one that does not solve the problem. Just pass it to, uh, on, uh, on the another judge who will be comforted with this uh, necessity. Finally, the fourth option is to resort to judicial activism. It can assume the form of dynamic and creative, but consistent with the law interpretation, um, especially whatever the lawmaker left some room for this. Uh, or a form of subversion that will uh, bend the act of law to fit the requirements of one's conscience, knowing that this is an action contra legal, uh, contra legal um, albeit hidden and valid in the specific arguments uh, intended often, often to hide real motives. This, our attention uh, should be focused in particular on this choice on the path of subversion. A judge, when he rules, doesn't forget what his conscience dictates, but also doesn't openly oppose the language of the act of law. In other words, it is attempt to bend the text on, uh, of an act of law to limits of his conscience finds um, um, bearable. Uh, this always prompts a question about the moment when the discretion accorded to judges is transgr uh, transgressed. It's, uh, it is not possible to delimit in the abstract way the admissible ways of escaping into subversion or admissible depth of this escape. Everything depends on the circumstances of a specific case. A possibly common denomina uh, denominator is the interest of the man whom we are judging in the specific case. And on the other hand, the interest of the state which should also be taken into account. These values, uh, so self-evident today, move us even farther away from the tenets of legal positivism. In the event of collision between legal and moral norms, a judge should be able to access and balance of uh, collating values. Judicial activism is especially important and anticipated by the public. Wherever the quality of codified law is not good and the courts are the last link that can mend a bad law in the process of applying it. When a judge delivers a ruling, uh, he must account for formalism because it's bound by the text and, uh, of an act of law and the conscience of his decision, consequences of his decision. Uh, when applying the law, a judge should also bear in mind ethical norms, always see the man whose case is his judging. He should also be aware of systematic context that his ruling could produce unexpected um, effects. Uh, our conference discusses the quality and shape of the people-to-people -people relations um, that are described, regulated, and protected by law. Allow me then to give an example um, 
uh, one problem which uh, has stirred um, a legal controversy in Poland and which uh, reflects the dilemmas uh, described uh, earlier. In one case, before the Supreme Court, um, an issue arounds uh, whether liability can be ascribed uh, in connection with injured person who had been diagnosed with a brain stroke too late. And uh, because of this suffered um, uh, grief, uh, bodily harm, resulting uh, in a total lack of contact. Um, uh, uh, for, uh, that's mean, um, it was question about breaking the family ties, completely breaking the family ties. Uh, this gave uh, rise to a question about the categories of ties uh, which should or which uh, are uh, protected by uh, law. On the one hand, um, um, uh, out of a pure empathy, uh, we sense that the breaking of family ties, uh, the feeling of being wronged, uh, should be uh, compensated by, uh, in some uh, way. In such rulings, because we got this kind of rulings also uh, in Poland, uh, let's us call them uh, empathic, uh, they have appeared, um, this kind of rulings have appeared in the legal Polish legal uh, space. Expressing the need for existence of legal protection in situations like this one, um, in such situation, um, all legal protection was based on um, uh, recognize, uh, this family uh, ties was recognizing as a personal rights, which opened um, up the way for compensation uh, in such situation. Uh, however, uh, this solution is not so clear and obvious because uh, we have to remember that, um, and um, we shouldn't forget, the adoption of the absolute system of the protection of personal right involves giving absolute erga omnes effects to the laws and protects uh, this, uh, this law. And uh, this uh, uh, acknowledging family ties, which include, in addition to this situation mentioned earlier, also the matter of uh, marital um, faithfulness or children um, obedience uh, towards their parents. Uh, if we, uh, we are going to treat it as a personal rights, it would represent a real normative revolution. Um, uh, one could, for example, imagine a court decision ordering a child to maintain family ties with parents because of a child, for example, because the child doesn't see his parents even on Christmas. Uh, or a decision ordering a third party um, to cease violating the family ties of spouse, uh, for example, because the husband is unfaithful to his wife. So uh, this is the example of hard cases and the example why we should still think about the consequences of such uh, situation. The art of judging has lost one of his, uh, its traditional attributes, to just simplify referencing to legis legislative text. In so-called hard cases, judges are left with one option to find a solution outside uh, the law. So, uh, can a judge have personal opinions, feelings? Um, the answer should be affirmative. Judges are human too. Uh, in, um, uh, uh, in, uh, during the uh, justice process, a judge should make sure that his independence as, and integrity are never questioned. However, apart from this aspect, a judge is not allowed to disclose his personal convictions. And we uh, had an interesting case in Poland some time ago. Uh, a judge who ran uh, for the National Council of uh, Judiciary uh, in Poland uh, came to a public hearing organized by the Helsinki Human Rights Foundation. And uh, when the hearing uh, was officially over, he handed the organizers uh, a copy of New Testament. Uh, he explains that uh, he had done it to show um, uh, the source uh, that uh, shaped his uh, hierarchy of values. 
uh, this was considered um, a valuation uh, of a principle of importiality. Uh, it was um, a, uh, argued, uh, argued that uh, by doing so, uh, he had destroyed the trust, for example, of atheists, um, uh, among others, uh, that they would be judged fairly. Uh, he was not elected to this uh, council. Um, this example shows the importance of the judicial uh, restraints. I have recently uh, attended a lecture by a U.S. court uh, judge. Uh, uh, as an example, she said that a judge uh, is not allow, uh, is not even allowed to declare himself to be against racism. We are talking about races before. Um, it should uh, or would seem to be very expected uh, norm uh, for a judge. But why not? Um, she said that because uh, if such judge were to try a case involving a racist, uh, the defendant could question his impartiality. It, so judicial activism is now a fact, in my opinion. Uh, on the one hand, it is a reaction to judges' dilemmas um, as a way to resolve them. On the other, however, uh, in this new open space for activity, the judiciary traditional attribute independence could be seen as providing grounds for making courts uh, unpredictable. Uh, if um, they have no simple relations on the base of a legislative uh, text. Uh, we have to remember that all uh, extremes are dangerous. On the one hand, traditional legal positivism carried the risk of oversimplification and moral ignorance. On the other, too much of judicial activism, especially when it becomes subversion, can lead to extensive moral um, uh, arbitrariness and uh, subjectiveness. One should always be mindful of the risk of the uh, one's own subjective approach adopted as a prim um, uh, primacy over the object objective sense of law. In both cases, the ultimate victim is our sense of justice. Thank you very much.